Well, again, we want to say welcome, and we are so glad that you are joining us for worship. If you happen to have a copy of God's Word with you today, uh, would you join me in uh, Luke chapter 24? Luke 24 is where we're going to be at today as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday and as we uh, turn our attention and our heart and our affections on King Jesus for just a few moments today. Let me pray for our time, and then we're going to dive on into God's Word. Father, I thank you for this chance just to spend some time together in your Word. Father, I pray that what you want to say and speak into our life, that, Father, we would have ears to receive and a heart receptive to hear what your Word says, what your Spirit is saying to us through your Word today. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. And Father, we thank you for this truth we know, that the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, changes everything. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last year, I uh, went to the optometrist and began to go through the process of getting an uh, examination of my eyes, and they were doing all the things that they normally do. And we got to the close-up reading version, and now that I'm 46, the doctor said, uh-huh. I'm like, why are you uh huh Like, what's going on? He said, I've been telling you for a few years it was coming, and you've arrived. You now need bifocals. And so now I have progressive lenses. There's no lines, and it took me a time to adjust. But I was amazed that I had seen myself over the course of the year before that eye exam. I had seen myself getting larger and larger Bibles to preach from. Look, no joke, folks. The Bible was so big, I think they could have seen it from the space station. I mean, it was big, and the font was huge, and I could read it like, well, about here. Uh, like I can read this one with the proper magnification on my eyes. I mean, we all have had moments like that, haven't we? We've had moments where we couldn't maybe physically see something clearly, or, or maybe we couldn't see a situation in life clearly. Maybe it was a relationship you had. And you couldn't see the problem, but you knew something wasn't exactly right. Maybe you found yourself in that situation with work. Maybe you've tried to advance your career at work, and you tried to advance, and you tried to advance, but you're just not getting anywhere, and, and you're wondering, and, and, you're, and, and you're wondering if there's something that you're missing. Maybe you've tried to get your finances in order and straight, but you found yourself continuing to struggle. There's something you either you don't understand, there's a piece of information that's missing that is keeping you from seeing the situation as clearly as you can see it. You know, when we find ourselves in situations like that, it's a lot like me with my reading glasses or my glasses, is, is, is one bit of information can change from seeing something unclearly to seeing it absolutely clearly. Just one bit of information, just one fact, just, just one little something to help you see things clearly. Today in Luke chapter 24, we're going to look at an encounter from God's Word where two disciples were struggling. They had just seen Jesus crucified on a Roman cross, and it was horrendous. It was difficult. It was overwhelming for them. And they had seen him placed in a borrowed tomb of a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And they had seen a, st a stone rolled over that tomb. And on this day that they're, we're going to look at this encounter, the day that they, the Resurrection Sunday, they, they find themselves struggling to understand this information that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. And they're confused. And they need something and they're struggling. And these disciples are a lot like maybe you and me. Maybe you found yourself struggling a lot in life lately. Maybe you found yourself struggling with life decisions. Maybe you found yourself struggling with a particular sin. Maybe you found yourself struggling with something over and over and over again. And maybe today God brought you to this place so you might hear about something that literally changed everything. An event, an action of the hand of God that changed absolutely everything. Today we're going to learn, like these disciples learn, that the resurrection changes everything. It changed it for these disciples on a road walking to Emmaus, and it changes you and me on the road we're walking in life right now. The resurrection changes everything. Look with me in verse 13 of Luke 24. We're going to jump right on in to this passage today. And, and here's what we see happening. 
That very day, two of them were going, this is the day of the resurrection, the day that they're getting reports that the tomb is now empty and the stone has been rolled away and that they, at this point, think that the ladies had only seen visions of angels. And they said two of them were going, uh, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But listen, listen, look at verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. See, these two disciples had seen everything that transpired over the last few days. They had seen everything from Jesus' betrayal and seen Jesus' trial. And they had seen him being condemned on a cross. And they had seen him dying. And they had seen the side pierce and the crown of thorns and all that stuff. And they had seen and heard of him being placed in a tomb. And they hear that this tomb is now empty and they are still confused. They don't quite understand. They're overwhelmed by all the things that they've seen happen. But it's this encounter with Jesus on the road to Emmaus where God reveals himself to them. And my prayer for you gathered in this place today is that we would have a moment where Jesus reveals himself to us in the same manner. That he opens our eyes and we might see him for who he truly is. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes that for us today. Now, Four things I want to share with you as we look through the rest of Luke chapter 24. Four things that the resurrection changes. And the first one is this. The resurrection changes the way... You see the cross. The resurrection changes the way you see the cross. Look look at as we go on in verse 17. Verse 17 says, And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? So Jesus walks up behind these two disciples or walks up to them and, and they're going on the road to Emmaus. They're confused. They're confounded by the things that have happened over the last few days. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. They can't make sense of it. And Jesus comes up to them and he's asking them what they're talking about, what they're, what they're conversing about. And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? I mean, he's like, have you no clue what's transpired? Jesus has been crucified. There's been much uproar. He came into town riding on a donkey, and there was a lot of fanfare and palm branches and people throwing their coats down on the ground. There was a lot happening, and you don't know. Verse 19 says, and he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. Verse 20, and how our chief priest and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, crucified him. Look look, look at verse 21. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Do you know there's two ways that you and I can view the cross? And these disciples in their discussion with Jesus reveal to us the two ways that we can see the cross. And the first way is this, that we can see the cross of Jesus as simply the martyrdom of a good man. We can just think that he was a good man, maybe a good teacher. He had a lot of things to say about the Old Testament scriptures, a lot of things to teach. And it would seem that at this point, that's what these two disciples were thinking had happened because Jesus had died and he had been buried in a tomb and it seems as if his body's gone and there's no way to explain this. And it was merely, possibly at this point, the conclusion that they were drawing. And maybe even you today and many in our society believe that Jesus was simply a first century rabbi who wandered across the Galilean hillside, who had no clue, or who really was not the Son of God. His death was just simply tragic. Without the fact of the resurrection... This is the conclusion we can draw. We can draw the conclusion that merely the fact that Jesus' death on the cross was a sad thing, that the cross was a sad thing, that the cross was a, a sad reality. Without the fact of the resurrection, that is what the cross may appear to be to us. All we need to do is pull up TV or social media and we see bad stuff. Does it seem like every time you turn on the news there's something bad happening? There's always something bad. 
And as we see this bad news, it can cause us to be sad. And we see the sadness of these disciples. They were, they were sad with the news that they were experiencing because they deemed it to be bad news. And we can view that the cross of Jesus was simply sad and bad news because it's the martyrdom of a good man. But there's another way to see the cross. Look, look at verse 21. Look, 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 look what they said. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. So you can see the cross of Jesus as a sad reality, maybe the martyrdom of a really good man, but, but you also can see in the resurrection brings to light that the cross was the sacrifice of the Son of God for our sins. See, that's the reality that the resurrection changes about the cross. That it is something more, there's something significant. Look at the word that, that the disciple uses. He uses it. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. The word redeem means to set free or liberate from an oppressive situation. In the first century, the Jewish people were experiencing Roman occupation of their country. Everywhere they looked, there was a Roman centurion. There was someone telling them they had to do something. There was someone oppressing them. They were experiencing governmental oppression in their day. Places all around the world where people are experiencing the same thing. And the Old Testament scripture said that God would send his Messiah who would set God's people free. He would redeem them, liberate them from an impressive situation. So when Jesus came on the scene, that's what I thought what Jesus would do, that Jesus would come and he would come in, come in and he would overthrow the Roman government and all that stuff would happen. But we learn in light of the resurrection is that Jesus came to set our hearts free. He came to set us free from, at the very core level of who we are, to set us free from sin, to set us free from death, to set us free from those things. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22. He said, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's saying this is an absolute fact. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now listen to this. For as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now, this, this is really good. Last part. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. See, we can see the cross as the, the martyrdom of a good man, but the reality is the resurrection lets us know that no, this is indeed the sacrifice of the Son of God to atone for our sins, to pay our sin debt. That's not all the resurrection changes. The resurrection also changes the way you see the empty tomb. Look at verses 22, 23, and 24. Here's what we go on in this encounter that Jesus is having with these two disciples. And here's what, what, what they said. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. It's interesting that the very first people to, to hear the news were women, but giving further validity to the claim of the resurrection because in the first century that would have not been so. It would have not been so for a woman to be the validator of some tr uh, significant event. The reality is, is that Jesus did that just to let us know that his claims were true. And that's another sermon for another time. But as over some of the women of our company amazed us, they were at the tomb early in the morning. And verse 23 says, And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were uh, who with us went to the tomb. And found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. You know, there's two ways that you and I can see the empty tomb today. We can see the empty tomb is the reality that maybe someone stole the body of Jesus. You know, that Matthew 27 tells us that that was the theory being proclaimed by the Jewish leaders in that day. They think someone just came and stole the body of Jesus. But there's some problems with that, but we'll get to that in just a moment. But, but look what verses 24 and verse 24 of Luke 24 says. It says, Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. These two disciples were walking to Emmaus knowing that the body of Jesus was gone. And it wasn't just on the words of Mary and Mary, it was on the words of the other disciples. It was on the account of many other people. There was a, a lot of testifying to this reality that the body of Jesus was gone. Now, there are some who think in our culture, even today, that someone possibly stole the body of Jesus. 
There are a number of problems with that claim, but I want to give just you a couple of things that Scripture tells us that lets us know that something more happened than someone simply physically taking the body of Jesus. There were Roman guards posted outside. Roman centurions were significantly known for their ability to have control of the situation. The Roman government came in and occupied a significant area of the world. All the known world at one time was under Roman law. So they had unbelievable power and authority. Matthew 27, uh, verses 62 through 66, tell us about this guarding of the grave with the Roman centurions. Another reason there's a problem with this idea that someone had taken the body of Jesus because the reality is that there were many eyewitnesses. There were hundreds of eyewitnesses. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 through 8, writes this, talking about Jesus, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to, listen to this, more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, talking about going on to be with the Lord. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, now here's what Paul says, as to one untimely born, meaning he didn't hear the gospel, he didn't place his faith in Jesus when all the others did, he appeared also to me. 500. 500 people. Way over that, attested to seeing Jesus resurrected, alive and well. See, we can see the cross and we can see the tomb as merely just a, 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 a sad event. Or we see the cross as a sad event, we can see the tomb as merely just this uh, a bogus thing that someone stole the body. But the resurrection tells us that something else happened. That God raised his son Jesus from the grave. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says, And when they came and did not find this body, they came back saying that they had even seen visions of angels who said he was what? what, what what's that last word on the screen say? Alive. Jesus is alive even today. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. And the resurrection tells us there's something else happening in this empty tomb. There's something else more significant happening in this empty tomb. That, that God had indeed raised his son Jesus from the grave. The tomb was not empty because of the schemes of man. It was empty because of the hand of God. I grew up in a church. Went to church every Sunday. Easter, mama got me a new shirt or a tie or sometimes a jacket. and I walked in. Ready to go. I had heard all the stories. I had heard all the stuff. But it wasn't until I placed my faith in Jesus that I was born again. You can hear all the stories. You can hear about the empty tomb. You can hear about that. But until you believe in the resurrection and the one who was raised from the dead, that he indeed died on a Roman cross for the forgiveness of your sin, you won't have eternal life. You won't have a relationship with God the Father. Not only does the resurrection change the way we see the cross and the empty tomb, it changes the way you see the Bible. Look, look with me as we go on in verses 25 through 27. It says this. Jesus responds to all of these claims, all of this news. They tell him about Jesus' body being gone and the reports of the women having visions of angels and all this stuff. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, there's a couple of ways you can see the Bible. And the resurrection changes how you can see the Bible. Because for many of us, the Bible is simply a collection of moral lessons and stories. There's a lot of moral lessons that we can learn about how to live life and how to be a good person and how to be moral. These disciples that we are talking about today, they had seen the Old Testament scriptures. They had a lot of it memorized, large chunks of it memorized. They understood it. They had meditated on it. They had spent hours reading it. But they didn't realize that there was more to the scriptures than simply the stories and the moral directives and imperatives contained within it you see there's more to the bible than simply learning a bunch of stories there's more to god's word than simply a bunch of moral lessons 
The reality is, is that when we believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead, and we believe that God's word is truth, it is inerrant in every way, it is without any mixture of error. We believe it to be true for living our life every single day. It changes the way we view it. It's not merely a collection of moral teachings, but it's something more. The Apostle Paul said this about God's Word. He said, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may listen to this. There's a result of. We don't just read the Word of God just so we can know these moral lessons and we can know these stories. Paul says there's something more. He says, So that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So what is the other way to view God's word? What does the resurrection change about how we see God's word? The resurrection helps us to see that the Bible is one big story pointing to Jesus. From cover to cover, in every book, in every chapter, either through whisper or through proclamation, It is telling us that it is all about Jesus. And Jesus even himself did this. In verse 27, we read this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And Jesus went through the Genesis creation narrative. I don't know if he did that or not. But he could. And he went through the teachings of the prophets. And he went through the Psalms. And he went through their journey on the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And he he shared with them, all these things point to Messiah. All these things point to Jesus Christ. Born in Bethlehem. Lived in Nazareth. The Son of God. The Savior of the world. See, the resurrection changes how we see Because once we place our faith in Jesus as indeed the Savior of the world, it changes how we see God's Word. We see it as many scenes of one grand story pointing to Jesus, the Son of God. And so when we read God's Word, we see it either pointing back to Him or pointing forward to Him, but it's all pointing to Him. Recently, a couple years ago actually, I finished a series of books that I had put on the back burner and wanted to read. These books were written by an author by the name of C.S. Lewis or the Chronicles of Narnia. And I was reading through this series and read it from, from start to, to finish and, and completed it and, uh, and loved, loved the series. And as I was reading each and every book, I was drawn again and again to every scene that C.S. Lewis put in these books to point to Jesus. See, C.S. Lewis was a believer. He had placed faith in Christ. And he he was pointing to share the truth of the gospel even in this story. In an even grander way, we see God's word on every chapter, be it through whisper or through shouting, pointing to Jesus, the Son of God. And my hope for you today is that maybe in something said or something done or the lyric of song, that the Holy Spirit is taking God's word and speaking to your heart and showing you God's goodness and his mercy and how much he loves you and what his son Jesus did for you is he laid down his life on a Roman cross, came up out of empty tomb and fulfilled what the scripture said about him. But there's one more thing before we leave our time today. The resurrection changes how you see Jesus himself. The, re- the resurrection changes how you see Jesus himself. Look, look, look at the closing verses of this encounter. So after Jesus had taught them all these things and the scriptures about himself, it had told all the Old Testament scriptures and pointed uh, about him. He, he said, verse 28, So they drew near to the village where they were going to Emmaus, to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And he, when he was at the table with them, listen to this. He took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. And they arose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the leaven, and those whom were with them gathered together. 
You know, there's two ways that you and I can see Jesus Christ today. The first way we can see him is a stranger. All up to this very moment in the scripture that I read to you today, for for the walking, the whole seven mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, these guys viewed Jesus as some stranger. Their eyes were closed by the Holy Spirit, closed to understanding his identity and his reality of who he was. And for the whole journey, he was simply a stranger. They asked him to stay the night, and he was still a stranger to them. They didn't recognize him, but it was only when Jesus did something very significant that that they understood who he was. Their eyes were open to who he was. Jesus took bread, and the scripture says he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Now, why was it in that that their eyes were open? Because see, it was that some of these disciples were probably gathered when Jesus gathered the thousands and he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. It was probably at times when they were heard of the word of what happened at this last supper that Jesus had with his disciples when he took bread during the meal and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. See, for many of us who walk throughout life, Jesus is merely a stranger, someone we hear about from time to time, someone who comes up in conversation, but not someone who we know is our personal Savior and Lord. But see, the resurrection changes that. The resurrection changes that. The resurrection declares that He is more than a stranger, but He desires to be Savior and Lord and Master of our lives, to lead us and guide us. We might live for Him and honor Him. Verse 30 talks about that blessing and breaking. But look what happens in verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. Maybe right now, you are experiencing in your heart exactly what these disciples experienced that day. Maybe you're experiencing an internal churning in your life. Maybe you know there's something that needs to change. Maybe you know that you can no longer keep walking in this way. You can't keep walking in this sin. You can't keep walking in this way. And you're experiencing the same internal tug that's happening. You know, God does a couple of things to call us to himself. He uses an internal call like that, and he uses an external call. That's what you're hearing, is you're hearing God's word today. And maybe today, God is doing that to draw you to himself. For you to get to the place where you realize you are a sinner, and you can't keep living this life with Jesus being merely a stranger to you. Today's maybe the day where you need to surrender your life, and place your faith and hope in Jesus Christ. But, but that's not all that we do. Look at verse 33. Verse 33 is compelling. And it says, And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them together. See, not only did these people, did these disciples respond and believe in Jesus and understand in light of the resurrection, but what did they do? In light of the resurrection, they went about and started telling people about Jesus. They got about the business of sharing the story of the resurrection. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're here today, we don't just say Christ is risen indeed on Easter Sunday morning. We declare it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year until he comes again. If you're here today and you're a believer, I want to encourage you to go out and and use your testimony, use your story, use what God's been doing in your life. The reality is you have multiple testimonies of God's mercy and grace in your life. You have the testimony maybe of how he saved you with that testimony, of how he showed up in many powerful ways in your life. So I want to ask you to do something very, very simple. Ask a simple question. Today, is Jesus a stranger to you or is he your Savior? If Jesus is a stranger to you, I want to invite you to do something. I want to invite you to turn from the way you've been living your life. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. We do things, we sin, we mess up, we make mistakes. 
And maybe Jesus is a stranger to you, and what you need to do is you need to turn from how you've been living and trust what Jesus Christ did on the cross as being sufficient to pay for all the stuff that you're trying to work and be good and, and, and do things to overcome all your mistakes. Jesus overcame them on the cross. And if you'll place your faith in him today, your trust in him today, he will not be a stranger to you anymore, but he'll become your Savior and Lord. And here's how you do that. You simply call on the Lord. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, one of my favorite sections of Scripture, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to have a fancy prayer. You don't have to say a lot of fancy things. But if you're here today, and you know that today Jesus is a stranger and not your Savior, I encourage you today to right where you are, in this very moment, to call on the name of the Lord. And here's the promise of his word, the strong, permanent promise of his word. Whoever calls to the name of the Lord shall, will be saved. What a beautiful, beautiful promise. So here's the invitation today. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you've not moved from being a stranger to Jesus to him being your savior. There's some guys that will be down here available. I'll be available. Pastor Gary will be available. We'll have some deacons available. They'll be on these front pews of these two outside sections. If you'd like to talk with us about more about following Jesus, we'd love to help you. But if you're a believer here today, we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. And let's worship Him. Let's take this last song and worship Him and praise Him. Maybe come and, and, and give a prayer of thanksgiving at this altar today. You come. You come. As we sing.
joining us for worship today but also I want to say if you're here today and maybe you felt a little like those disciples of stirring your heart something needs to change you need to talk with somebody I'm gonna stay in, right down here until everybody's gone and if you want to pray with somebody or want to talk with somebody or I know you probably have family stuff but 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 the most important decisions we make in life are not the physical ones but it's the spiritual ones we make between us and God so I'm available I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you have a wonderful Easter celebration with family. Gary, you close us today. Let's take a moment to pray together. Remember, Easter's all about He is risen. We have a risen Savior, and we have a hope of eternal life with Him. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. We pray that our eyes might be open, that we might see even as those followers saw Jesus, that we might experience his presence in our life, that we might allow him to lead us as we journey through life. Pray your blessings upon each person here today. We're so thankful for each one. We pray you'll be with us as we continue the celebration of Easter. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're alive. We have hope in you, and we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter. Oh,